David Ellis. I have the privilege of serving as the interim uh, executive director of the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And it's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to another in our series of talks that relate to forests. And tonight we have a very special presentation, not one but two actually, by talented scientists from Harvard. Steve Wasfi from the School of Engineering and Andrew Richardson from the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. And we're going to be talking about the role of forests in climate change and carbon sequestration. As to tonight's program, we're going to hear two talks. First will be from Andrew Richardson and the second from Steve Wasfi will give an overview of their research. Um, it'll be rather interesting because there'll be some places where you'll see a lot, we presume, uh, complementary. Maybe there'll be places where they differ. Uh, we'll have a few questions after the two of them have spoken that I'll moderate, and then we're going to open it to your questions and leave time for that. I'll say a few words about Steve and then about Andrew. Steve is the Abbott Lawrence Roch Professor of Atmospheric and Environmental Science at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He has a joint appointment with the University Center for the Environment. He earned his BS in chemistry, and as a chemist, I'm all for that, uh, at the University of Chicago, and earned his master's and PhD in chemistry here at Harvard. Like Andrew, he conducts extensive research on the effects of forests on climate with a special focus on long-term measurement to help understand the processes that affect the composition of the atmosphere. Uses a variety of instruments for measuring the carbon cycle and he has served I'll just mention a few of the committees. One is NASA Earth, Science, Earth System Science and Applications Advisory Committee, NASA Advisory Council, as well as on the Carbon Cycle Science Plan Working Group, and the North American Carbon Program Writing Group. Now we'll hear from Steve in a few minutes, and first we're going to hear from Andrew Richardson, Assistant Professor in Organismic and Evolutionary Biology here at Harvard. He's leading an impressive and very exciting body of researchers and research initiatives around forest ecology and the carbon cycle and the biological impacts of climate change. He, like Steve, has a research site at Harvard Forest, which for those of you who have visited it know well, uh, you know how important it is and valuable it is. And any of you that have not visited it, I encourage you to. Uh, some of you may have been here to hear David Foster uh, speak in September. Andrew received his PhD from Yale University, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. We're particularly glad that he defected to his alma mater's big rival. Thank you, Andrew. It's all yours. I, I will say the uh, pizza is better in New Haven. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for coming to hear me speak tonight. Um, is that one on? yes. uh, I'm sure you had uh, better things to do with your time, but I appreciate your, your coming out to hear about climate change and forests and um, you know, my perspective on, on, on why things matter. Uh, this is a map that shows the distribution of forests around the world. Um, evergreen forests, they retain their, their leaves year-round. They're shown in dark green. Uh, there's parts of the Amazon that are evergreen tropical forests. Of course, in northern Canada and the Pacific Northwest, across Scandinavia and uh, parts of Russia, uh, large expanses of evergreen forests. Deciduous forests are shown in lighter, lighter green across the uh, eastern half of the, the US, parts of South America, and uh, particularly in, in northeastern uh, in Russia, northeastern Russia. Forests cover nearly a third of the, uh, the Earth's land surface area. And forests are really important because of the services 
and goods um, on which human society relies. Wood is used by pretty much every society um, on Earth. It's used for building materials, uh, for making tools and uh, artistic uh, implements, uh, musical instruments, for example. Provides paper and non-timber forest products, such as uh, fruits and other foods and medicinal supplements are also obtained by forests. So forests are really important to society. Of course, forests also provide habitat for countless types of organisms, um, mammals and birds, insects, soil microorganisms, for example. Humans use forests for recreation, hunting, fishing, hiking, and so forth. Forests provide additional services to society which we may not appreciate so much. Um, one of these is, is protection of our water resources. Anyone who lives in the city of Boston gets their water from the Quabbin Reservoir, which wouldn't, be, wouldn't provide the pure water it does if it wasn't surrounded by forests that are protected. But forests also play a particularly important role in climate change because when trees grow, through the process of photosynthesis, trees remove uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And when they grow, that carbon is stored in wood, branches, uh, trunks, uh, roots, and, uh, and makes its way below ground into the soil. And it's that role of, that forests play in the carbon cycle that makes them so important to, uh, to climate change. I'm just going to give you some numbers here that, that show the, the significance of forests in the global carbon cycle. And I'm going to use the term a pedogram quite a bit. A pedogram is one billion tons. Now, first of all, forests store, globally forests store 850 pedograms in wood, leaves, litter, and soil. And this is very similar in magnitude to the 750 pedograms of carbon that are stored in the Earth's atmosphere. What this means is that small changes in the amount of carbon stored in forests can have can affect similarly um, the atmosphere. So a 1% change in the amount of carbon stored in forests would basically result in a 1% change in carbon stored in the atmosphere. Also, every year, forest growth removes two, two and a half petagrams of carbon per year from the atmosphere. This is a substantial amount of carbon, but it's offset by losses of 1.3 petagrams of carbon per year that result from tropical forest defore deforestation and land use change. So the difference of these two is about one petagram of carbon. What we can see, though, is that that, that difference, that the, the net uptake by forests, would be a lot bigger if tropical deforestation and land use change was reduced. And to put these numbers in context, <coughs> worldwide fossil fuel, emission, fossil fuel emissions total eight petagrams of carbon per year. So forest growth is helping to offset the fossil fuel emissions uh, from human society. But it could do a much greater job of doing that if we reduced losses due to deforestation and land use change. This figure shows the uh, upward trend in carbon atmospheric carbon dioxide that's been measured um, at Mauna Loa in Hawaii since 1960. You can see there's an increasing trend over that period from 320 parts per million 50 years ago to 390 parts per million now. The red line shows a sort of smooth uh, five-year moving average, and the actual measurements are shown as this oscillating uh, lighter gray line around that red line. If you look carefully at that oscillation, you'd see that there's this sort of typical annual cycle here, where atmospheric CO2 is high in April and, and low in October. And the reason for this pattern has to do with the um, activity of vegetation on the Earth's surface. The fact that there's more vegetation in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, and when this vegetation in the northern hemisphere is active, beginning in April, it starts to take carbon out of the atmosphere, drawing down that level of atmospheric CO2 to its minimum at the end of the growing season. And then it starts to rise again um, during, during the, um, the dormant winter season in the northern hemisphere. What this means is that the growing season and the growing season length plays a large role in atmospheric CO2. And this motivates, um, this motivates my interest in what's called 
phonology, which is basically studying the rhythm of the seasons. Phonology is concerned with, with seasonal biological events, such as bud burst and flowering in the spring, or leaf coloration and leaf fall in autumn. We generally use the term, or I use the term, to refer to plants, but there's phenological events in, in um, animals as well. For example, migration um, by birds or by, by l large mammals, for example, and breeding times, nesting times, and so forth. Those are all considered phenological events. I want to distinguish uh, phonology from <laughs> phrenology, which, uh, as many of you may know, is the Victorian pseudoscience that had to do with how the, um, the shape of one's head influenced, or was believed to influence uh, personality and character. Um, I, I think much to the relief of my department, I focus more on, on phonology. <laughs> so, in the discussion of climate change, uh, forest and carbon cycling, phonology is important because it affects the growing season or it determines the growing season length and controls how much carbon forests can take out of the atmosphere. But there's another reason that phonology is itself important in this discussion, and that is that phonology is affected by climate change. Year-to-year -year variation in weather affects the dates of, of phenological events such as bud burst and, and flowering. And you may recall that the 2010 spring was extremely warm and, and leaves came out several weeks earlier than we'd, we'd seen them um, in previous years. Now, interestingly, over, over the last 20 years at, at Harvard Forest, some long-term observations show or give some indication that, that climate change is having an effect and causing phenological shifts there as well. And what these data show is that um, bud burst by oaks in spring is occurring about a week earlier now than it was in the early 1990s. And in the fall, the leaves are falling off about a week later than they were in the early 1990s. And that two-week extension of the growing season greatly enhances the capacity of the forest to take carbon out of the atmosphere. So this sort of motivates my interest in phenology and why it matters for, for climate change. Now to look into some of these issues in more detail, um, I've been mounting inexpensive webcams on, on research towers, um, mostly across the Northeast, but I'm now expanding this network across, across the United States. And this, if you haven't been to Harvard Forest, you might not recognize this as Harvard Forest, but this is from the, um, the Wafsi Group's research tower at Harvard Forest. And um, this is my camera, it's pointing to the north and it's showing the forest canopy in late winter uh, before the leaves have started to emerge. Now these cameras, they take pictures every half hour and upload them to a server, and we can do quantitative analysis or, or a visual assessment to um, determine when the leaves are coming out and how, fa how fast they're developing and so forth. So this is late winter before the leaves come out. This is the beginning of May as the leaves are just starting to come out. You can see the canopy is really kind of this luminous bright green. This is in early, early June as the canopy is, is nearing um, complete development. You can see that you can pick out different species here. I, I think this might be an ash, but I'm not completely sure. Um, there's some evergreen scattered around. By the middle of August, we're starting to get a bit of yellowing in the canopy. And then here we are in late October with the sort of lovely reds and oranges of, of autumn. What I'm using these data, uh, these images for, is to get quantitative data on when the leaves are coming out, when they're changing color, how long the growing season's lasting, how bright green the leaves are getting, um, how quickly they develop in spring, and then using that to understand um, the spatial patterns of, of forest uh, carbon uptake and, and growth. And this just shows the current state of our network um, across, across North America. We have sites in, in northern Canada, um, northern Saskatchewan, Quebec, as I said, concentrated in New England. Um, if you're at all interested, you can go to the project webpage, phenocam.sr.unh.edu. Uh, you can always see the latest pictures there. For a while, you know, Steve was telling me that he was checking out the Harvard Forest um, camera page um, every day. And it's sort of interesting that you can just see what, the, uh, what it looks like out in Petersham whenever you want. Just want to summarize and then uh, give, give Steve a chance to talk. 
Um, forests matter because for climate change because growing forests remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The carbon is stored in wood and soils, and forests thus help to mitigate fossil fuel emissions. Obviously, they don't completely offset human fossil fuel emissions, or we wouldn't see that dramatic rising increase in atmospheric CO2, but they do, they do help. Phenology is important because climate change is affecting the length of the growing season, and a longer growing season should enable forests to take up more carbon dioxide. Now, I want to just briefly close with a few points about forests and, and climate change mitigation. Um, the first part was talking about my research, and th these are I'm going to talk right here is about some of the challenges I see and, and some of the opportunities for forests to uh, help mitigate climate change and, and uh, anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions. So in terms of challenges, demand for wood and other forest products is continuing to lead to um, forests. Uh, deforestation and uh, forest damage in, in many parts of the world, development and land use change, particularly uh, e or even in New England where we've seen a lot of forest growth over the last 150 years, uh, development of subdivisions and so forth is, is actually causing a slight reduction in forest cover across the state in the last decade. Um, diseases, pests and invasive species are a real threat to forests um, over the next say century. Um, you saw there was a really nice article in the New York Times last month uh, that included some of the Harvard for forest research, uh, but also talking about things like the mountain pine beetle in the uh, northwestern or in the western and northwestern uh, United States, um, and forest fires and, and other disturbances um, probably will become more of an issue. We saw that uh, recently in Texas and, and Arizona, just with warmer, hotter, drier summers. Um, causing increases in, in forest fires. Um, all of these are challenges to, you know, counting on forests to continue to, to remove a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere. Same time, there's some opportunities, I think. There may be opportunities uh, to, for new management strategies to actually increase the amount of carbon stored in forests, whether that's um, increasing the density of carbon by the way trees are harvested, uh, through some selective harvesting, perhaps. Um, or just increasing the amount of forest land that is um, uh, under management. But also, conservation and preservation are incredibly important, just as, as important it is that we um, bring new lands into conservation to protect them for the future. We want to make sure that what is protected now um, is not lost. There, there's great value in... Um, even if an old forest is not actively taking up as much carbon as a young forest, keeping that, that old forest preserved um, is incredibly important for the future. So with that, um, maybe I'll just pass it on to Steve, and uh, then we can go to the discussion. Okay, okay this is not the right place here. Oh, though. you're right. Just one, I think. No. Okay. There. So um, Andrew has done a really good job of introducing this topic. He's, he's pointed out that forests, on average, are removing CO2 from the atmosphere. We burn about eight petagrams of, uh, release about eight petagrams of carbon as CO2 from fossil fuel burning. And forests miraculously take up somewhere between one and two. And actually, they've been doing that more or less uh, since the 1950s. Well, why the heck should they do? Why should forests be growing bigger? Uh, this is a question that uh, is one of many that we started to think about in my group some time ago. And I start with, uh, to discuss this, uh, with um, uh, this slide from uh, David Foster's talk of a few weeks ago. And um, so we, we said, okay, we can't study all the forests in the world. We tried, actually. We have one of these the things that I'm talking about. We had one in Canada. We had one in Brazil. It's actually still running. But we started it at home at Harvard Forest, and we decided we were going to try to measure the amount of carbon being taken up or released by the forest every hour for 20 years. And that's a ridiculous thing to do, but we actually have done it. So we started in 1991. And this is now 2011, so we've actually done it for 20 years. So why, but why, do, why were we interested in New England? I mean, New England, we have these little 
tiny trees, I mean, they can't, they can't be important, right? Well, actually, but they are. So New England has a very, very odd natural history. So prior to European um, uh, colonization, the forest basically covered almost the whole landscape. And then uh, somewhere in here, in the uh, middle of the 19th century, forests were reduced to some remnant, 25 to 30 percent of the landscape. And then those farms were abandoned. You know, all those stone walls that you see out there, those were put there for a reason. And, and uh, basically, the farmers harvested the rocks. And they uh, spent some time um, uh, moving them around. And then uh, the forest came back. And so uh, we expect that this recovery of forests should um, be taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it as wood. So we took it away in the 18th century, but now we're, getting, we're, we're, we're um, putting it back on the land, taking it out of the, um, out of the atmosphere. And so the way we do this is we have a tower that sticks up above the canopy. And it's been there since 1989. Uh, this is a picture of Bill Munger, the uh, principal investigator on the tower. I think Bill's actually here in the audience. He's on top of this tower. So he's standing on top of a 15-story building. And no building, but um, otherwise it would be a 15-story building. And he's um, uh, working on some of the instrumentation there. This picture is actually out of the New York Times. There was an article that featured some of this a few weeks ago. And this device, uh, through some complicated technology, is able to actually measure the, the amount of CO2 that comes up out of the forest or goes back down onto the forest every hour. Uh, well, you know, lightning hits it and things, so maybe we don't actually do every hour of every day, but we certainly try to do our very best. In addition, we measure a whole bunch of stuff in the, in the woods. So, um, you know, we can have a lot of fun here climbing this thing. We can have even more fun scrounging around in, amongst the black flies and the mosquitoes and measuring where the uh, carbon is actually going into the trees, into the dead wood, into the roots, into the leaves, whatever. So, what did we find out? Uh, we found out that our preconceptions, and now I have a few graphs. They're kind of geeky, but I tried to make them look like they would look in a... In a um, you know, an annual report from your mutual fund. Um, I promise that there's no credit default swap type stuff in here. This is the real stuff. Um, and this is a bar chart that shows starting in 1991 and going on through 2008, the amount of carbon taken up by each hectare of Harvard Forest near that tower every year. A hectare is about the size of a, of a soccer field. And um, what you can see is that about two tons of carbon was taken up every year at the beginning. And this was a surprise because the forest is 80 to 100 years old. You know, the forest cover has been covered for a while. We didn't really expect such a large amount, although we, we had a suspicion that maybe it would be. And we expected in this forest, which is now getting on in years, that it should decline with time. And so, you know, and the NSF thought so too. So after we did this part, they said, okay, you're done. But we managed to find some extra funding to keep going with it, and then it did, it doubled. And actually more than doubled. So, so now every uh, hectare of Harvard forest is taking up between two and five tons of carbon per year. Now why the heck is it doing that? That certainly, people, we didn't expect that. Now in hindsight, when you look back, you say, well actually we, we should have known, right? Okay, well let's see. So this is the geekiest chart that I have. And, um, I just want to focus on this, this particular figure here. What it shows is it shows every hour of the day, and uh, we're kind of plotting it upside down because I'm an atmospheric scientist. So when, when this number goes below the zero line, it means that the forest is taking carbon out of the atmosphere. And this is an average for July, the month of July. And so during the nighttime, and let's say, so during the nighttime here, the forest is respiring, it's sleeping, you know, just like you, but we have to breathe and the forest breathes too. So it's releasing a certain amount. And that hasn't changed actually. The blue dots are the uh, 2008 and the, and the brown ones are, are, 2000, are 1992. So, so the amount that it respires every night hasn't changed very much. But look what happened in the middle of the day. In the middle of the day, the forest is taking up a, more than twice as much carbon per hectare as it was in 1992. Now why is it doing that? Well, let's see, what are the possibilities? So one possibility is that it's still regrowing, that succession is taking place and trees are changing. They had red maple, now we have oak, and that's actually, that's part of it. 
So that's one possibility. But so the legacy of prior land use, which basically ended at this place around 1850, this is now 2011. It's still unfolding. That's really interesting. And that have, tells us something about what's, gonna, what's going on worldwide as well. There's a lot of this kind of regrowing stuff worldwide. Another possibility is that because the climate is getting warmer, and we'll look at this in a minute, the growing season is getting longer. And Andrew talked about that. He said a week on each end, right? And, and I'm going to show you, well, yeah, but actually it's not a week on each end. So we, we disagree. We, we, we have a little fisticuffs coming up in a bit here. And then the, the, another thing is that plants grow better when you give them extra CO2. Maybe not so much at Harvard Forest, but we really can't tell that. We can't do an experiment to starve the forest of CO2. And also we're dumping some nitrates from air pollution on it, and that's fertilizer. So it could be that too. So let's see what we know. So we go around and we measure the trees. Um, and every year, or almost every year, we go out and we measure how much wood is out there by measuring the girth of the tree, counting them up, and applying some formulas. And um, what you see is, so this is the total amount of, of carbon in wood is plotted here on this bar chart, showing again from 1992 to, to the present time. And if you look at the gray bars, which represent everything except hemlock and oak, they don't do anything. So they're not, we're not actually, that part of the forest isn't growing. And the hemlocks are growing a little bit, and that's interesting because that's going to stop. They're all going to die from the woolly adelgid uh, plague. So th this is actually, some, we're going to see some interesting changes here. And meanwhile, look at the oaks. Now, oh, so oaks are really increasing their size and their mass there. And if you go and look at these things, they don't look that much bigger than when we put them in 20 years ago. But you know, this kind of circumference thing, it, it actually pays off. They're not getting any taller. It's a good thing, because we would have to make the tower taller if they did. But they're getting fatter. And it's kind of like us at our age, right? right. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, and the other thing about oaks is that they're more efficient in using sunlight than, than the trees that they're replacing. And so that seems to explain why, how, why, that, why they're sucking more out each year. Then there's the question about the growing season. And so, now, but I have my own definition of the growing season, right? I'm not going to accept Andrews. He, he just got here. So, but so, so, uh, so, so my definition of the growing season is I will de de start the growing season when the daily average of the respiration and uptake is zero and starting to go negative. That's when the growing season starts. And then when it, when, when it, it turns around and goes positive again, then it ends, which is different than when the leaves come on. And what you, what's happening is that, that it moved a lot earlier, not just a week, but more like two and a half weeks earlier, and it also moved a lot later. It moved earlier because the hemlocks in the understory are getting to, to be more important, so they're starting things going earlier, and then the oaks keep their leaves longer, right? If, who's got oaks in their backyard? You, know, you have to wait until Thanksgiving to rake the leaves, right? And that's not true for the other trees. So that, it's ended on both sides, but look at the difference. It's from 130 days in the 1990s to like 180 days. That's a huge change. And that's a change which is just associated with the change in the floristic composition. Now this is also an extraordinary figure. We have a, a climate station at Harvard Forest. And so temperatures have been measured there since the 1960s. And the average annual temperature in the 1960s was six and a half degrees Celsius which is, uh, I don't know, in the high 40s, I guess. It's cold in the wintertime there, high 40s Fahrenheit. Um, and it's actually increased by one and a half degrees Celsius in the, in, since the 1960s. It's an extraordinary amount. Now, there's a number of ways to explain this. One, the data is wrong. The other is, well, it's just something peculiar about Harvard Forest. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, maybe the, so, something about the New England climate. But actually, there's a very nice set of studies, one of which has gotten pretty famous recently by uh, Richard Muller and his friends at Berkeley, in which they look at the land surface temperature globally. And there's been a lot of dispute about it. And just within the last few weeks, Muller came out and said, the other guys were actually right. And, and this really embarrassed the, the, um, the coach brothers that funded him and all that. Anyway, um, and what he shows is that globally, the land surface temperature since the 1960s has gone up one degree Celsius. So Harvard Forest has gone up a little more, but you know, it's a regional thing. But it's actually, it's not out of line with what you see globally. And that's, this includes the tropics where the changes are less and at higher latitudes like here. So, all right, so that's clearly a factor as well. All right, 
So um, this brings me back to the end of the discussion, and, I, and I'll um, kind of leave this slide up. So what are the reasons why Harvard Forest is taking up CO2 every year? Oh, by the, and, and why we care is that for all the reasons that Andrew said. Forests as a whole are removing a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. Um, we don't know how long it's going to last. It could come back if the forests are destroyed. Um, and nobody actually knows. So let's see. So regrowing, this, we clearly have evidence that this is happening. Climate warming, we clearly have evidence that this is happening and that both of those are playing a role. This is the big one that we really don't know anything about, fertilization, right? Because we can't manipulate the forest to remove the influence of the fertilizer. We could add more. It's actually very expensive to do that, and, and it's actually not the right manipulation. So if a little bit is good, more is not necessarily better. So we can't actually answer the question by adding more. And it leads us to some questions. Well, when will this uptake stop? How big can Harvard Forest get? You know, we're going to have sequoia-sized trees in Harvard <laughs> Forest? Well, you know, it turns out that nobody actually knows the answer to that question. We, there's no way for us to know how big it can get. You know, in the southeast, if you, have, if you go to areas that have really been undisturbed, lowland areas or at least relatively um, good sites, some of those trees get really, really big. And uh, so we, nobody actually knows how long this can go on for. And that's the question I'm going to leave you with. Thank you very much. Sit. Do I have to sit there and with the glare of the... Uh... We'll turn it off. Okay. You have your microphone, so that's easy. And here comes the third chair. This are bright. It's pretty bright, yeah. There. Much better. A little better. Well, we've heard two interesting presentations that seem to have a lot of points in common and a few places where maybe there's a slight difference. But uh, I'm going to ask a question just because I get the privilege of doing that first, and then we're going to have a few questions back and forth, and then you're all going to have a chance to weigh in. Uh, Andrew, since, he, uh, since Steve seemed to be asking a little question about your data, <laughs> would you like to ask him a question? Hi. Uh, you already asked me one this afternoon. I, I, well, I did. That's why he, he answered it. <laughs> we just so so I had asked Steve um, where his numbers came from because using um, my numbers on the changes in the growing season length were based on observations of when the leaves came out in red oak and when they fell out, fell off in fall. And uh, I said, Steve, how'd you get yours? You know, your change is much bigger than the change I'm estimating. So. Yeah, so we estimated it by, or we, we, we defined the beginning of the growing season as when the, the carbon balance begins to go down into the forest. And we ended it when it came up. And what's interesting is that the first thing you do is you look at the seasonal temperatures and you say, well, that must be what's driving it. But because we can take it apart, we can actually see that a lot of it has to do with the change in the floristic composition of the forest which is it's one of those things, and if you then look in the scientific literature, a lot of people, you can actually see changes in the length of the growing season, even in the Mauna Loa record. So globally, trees are not doing, the growing season is actually getting longer globally also. And uh, people wanted to blame that on you know, CO2 fertilization and all this kind of stuff. And actually, it looks like you should think a lot about what happens as you uh, transition a forest from early successional to mid and late successional trees. The growing season is going to get longer just from the change in the composition. And I can't tell you how much of each, right? Because Andrew's an expert in phenology. It's, uh, phenology is controlled by g genes. And so uh, mm -hmm. trees age, their, their genes turn on at different times, and flourish in different species. You might comment further on that. Well, I was going to say, you, you said that the earlier spring was because of the increase in hemlocks and their evergreen, so they start photosynthesizing yeah, yeah. earlier. If all the hemlocks get wiped out, then we will change. see yes. spring coming, by your definition, coming much later. You should, yes. Yeah.
and the, the Wooly Adelgid is present at Harvard Forest, so oh. it will be there so, sooner or later. They will die. Is it a, a serious problem at this stage right now? I don't know. You might know better than me. I think, uh, I don't know, is Bill, is Bill Munger out here somewhere, Bill? Yes, in the middle back. Bill, well, how much Adelgid is out there? So basically, the, the trees have been uh, infested, but they haven't started to die yet. And they usually take about five years, I think. So we should see something pretty serious. Um, Andrew, a question for you. You were saying that you measured quantitatively uh, the data. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could say just a word about how that's done right. and how we get from that data, whatever it is, right. to the understanding. So digital camera pictures, like on your, just like your TV set, when you look at your TV set up close, you see a bunch of little red, green, and blue dots. Mm -hmm. And digital camera images have three layers, one red, one green, and one blue. And by looking at how bright the blue channel is relative to the other channels, we can quantify um, just the overall canopy greenness from, from just doing that sort of image analysis. Hmm. Steve, question for you, just uh, fertilization or fertilizer and that whole issue, because that's been in the press a whole lot about the impact of CO2 on growth. Maybe you could share a little bit more about what we know and what we don't know, and what should we look for to better understand what we read. This is a really, really hard problem, because um, if you take a plant in a pot and you grow it in a glass house, and you expose it to different levels of CO2, many of the plants will grow f faster with higher CO2. Um, a lot of them will also die faster. <laughs> so wh what effect this has on atmospheric CO2, even if you could translate directly, is, is kind of hard to know. But big trees out in the woods are not potted plants, and they don't necessarily respond the same way. Uh, so we, we really don't know. I guess we, we, we have a pretty good idea that tr plants in a Mediterranean climate will probably be stimulated by CO2 growth because they basically grow in the summertime using stored water in the soil from the winter, and they're more efficient using it when the CO2 is higher. But most trees are not growing in Mediterranean climate, and it, so it's just not obvious. Now. Let's open it up in let's open it up in general and, and who has a good question for either of these men? Yes, sir. Uh, you, you talked about the several factors going up and down between the trees and the climate. Uh, one thing that I think you didn't mention is what happens with the composition uh, and density of the forest as the temperature changes. Uh, and you, you hear about the species migrating or some are not able to migrate and things some species so Harvard Forest is a transitional forest. Uh, it's it's not a southern forest and it's not a boreal forest. It has some elements of each, and so uh, it can probably shift or things around a little better than forests that are more at the edge of their range. So the, the oaks are actually more at the northern edge of, the red oak is more at the northern end of its range, and so it will probably benefit. Um, I'm not sure that would be true for the red oaks in Georgia. Uh, so it's a little, it's, it's really hard to know. And the other thing that you really made a very good point there, that what will happen depends not just on temperature, but also on rainfall and on the water balance. And we can't really forecast that. So I, I think the answer is we really don't know. Um, Although I think red oak is better at handling drought than other species yeah. it coexist with. So under warmer temperatures, red oak is probably, and, and less precipitation, red oak is probably going to be OK. At Harvard Forest. At Harvard Forest. And it's, it is seen as sort of red oak and red maple is seen as kind of the forest of the future for, say, New Hampshire where right now you've got um, beech, birch, and, and sugar maple forests. Oh, one second. Speaking of sugar maple, mm -hmm. what would you care to say about uh, 
uh, maple syrup production coming going forward. Stock, uh, stock up now. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Andrew. <laughs> okay, there's that answer. Other questions? <laughs> Please. Um, when a tree dies and decays, um, what fraction of the carbon that it's stored over its lifetime is released into the atmosphere, and what fraction ultimately stays in the soil? So almost all of it will be released to the atmosphere. But in New England, it can take a very, very long time. So I'm sure you've been hiking in the White Mountains, and you go along and you see those stumps there, and they were cut in 19, between 1910 and 1920, and they're still there. So um, it can take a very, very long time. And uh, in fact, one of the compartments at Harvard Forest where we see carbon building up is in the dead wood. So that's one place where Harvard Forest is stashing away organic matter. So they're dying faster than they're decaying right now. Sir, you and then. Yeah, it's not it's not as complicated as as I might like to make it out to be. It's, it, you know, it's really wizardry, but okay, I'll let you in on the secret. So basically, we have at the top of that tower, we have just a tube that sucks air down and measures CO2 concentrations. The only trick is we measure it quickly, so 10 times per second. And we also have at the top of the tower uh, a device that measures the wind speed, an anemometer. But it's not your ordinary anemometer. It measures the wind speed 10 times per second. And then what we observe is that air parcels that are moving up have a different CO2 concentration on average than air parcels that are moving down. In the middle of the day in the summer, air parcels that are moving up are depleted in CO2 because it's been taken up by the forest. So we measure that difference. We measure the, essentially the, the, the covariance, if you will, between or the, the way they vary together, the CO2 concentration and the wind speed particularly the vertical wind, up and down. Ma'am, and then that, we're going to come to this side. Yes. I, I had a question. We have the good news of a rapidly growing forest in New England, but what about, say, the taiga in the northern Arctic or forests that are more constant or older forests still able to produce something more? Isn't that surprising? I would say that that is, um, so the traditional view was that as forests get old, they get to a point where their, their growth slows down and the, the CO2, there. so there's two processes going on. There's, there's photosynthesis where they take photos, uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere and respiration where it's released back to, uh, CO2 is released back to the atmosphere. And in young forests, photosynthesis greatly exceeds the respiration, so they're, they're taking up a lot of CO2. The traditional view was that as forests get older, there's much, there's much more of a balance between the two and old forests shouldn't be taking up carbon dioxide. Now just what old means hadn't really, in the, the sort of theoretical view that was never actually stated, like old means 50 years, old means 100 years, old means 500 years. But what a lot of um, measurements at these tower sites around the world shows that, is that even very old forests are still, still taking up substantial amounts of, of carbon dioxide. So at a um, site I work in northern Maine, it's a spruce hemlock dominated forest where the trees are 200 years old. Um, that site is taking up about half as much carbon dioxide as the Harvard forest is. Um, other sites, older sites around the world are also shown to be taking up a fair amount of carbon dioxide. He asked about really northern forests. Um, a concern, two things there might happen with climate change. First of all, um, warmer temperatures might allow boreal forests to um, just they'd have a longer growing season, the trees could grow more. But boreal forests also have a lot of organic matter stored in the soils that because of the cold, wet conditions has remained undecomposed. And as the climate warms, if those regions also become somewhat drier, it's expected that a lot of that stored carbon will be released back to the atmosphere. So boreal forests might grow more, but they'll also respire more. So that, that's a very uncertain question at the moment. In addition, there's the question of uh, pathogens, so insects. They change their population behavior when climate changes. And you can see this in the 
uh, bark beetle outbreaks. And there's also uh, questions of fire. So a lot of the forests of the world are fire-adapted ecology. Fire belongs there. When you warm up the climate, then you might actually push them off into grasslands. So, it, and, and we don't, we can't really answer these questions with accuracy. We, we worry about them and we study them. Questions on this side? I saw one hand there. Any question on this side? Sir. You're 100% right. Yeah, I would agree with that, too. It, it, the only thing is, if we didn't have forests to help us out, we'd be already be in a lot worse ca uh, place than we are now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think so. But um, it's something that we need to think about. So I've been actually more concerned about tropical forests with respect to that question. And uh, we're just publishing a paper in the next two weeks or so that shows that if you log those forests carefully, you can extract some good economic value from them and keep the carbon. Um, it's not done very often that way. And then there's all these interesting social science questions about why not. But I, there's no question that you could make a contribution that way. I believe, though, in, in reference to the gentleman's question, it'll help, but it's not going to solve the problem. Yeah, and I would say it, you, it might help at a local scale, but you wouldn't want to, say, cut down all the trees of New England and plant fast-growing species in the, you know, because yeah. of what that will do um, for climate change, because you would then lose you know, having monocultures of fast-growing trees isn't really a forest, and you lose the essence of what a forest is and a lot of the benefits that forests, or the other benefits that forests provide, such as recreation and habitat and water and things like that. Yeah, good point. Yes, sir. I don't know, hundreds of millions of years of evolution are hard to uh, <laughs> beat. <laughs> That's kind of what people are trying to do with, uh, with for example, the uh, algae, you know, growing algae in bags and, and then processing the algae to get either, well, to get oils and cellulose, which are then turned into, into fuel. Um, as an alternative to fossil fuels. I mean, you can, you can, there are some technologies that people are working on, but um, in terms of actually growing better trees, I mean, foresters have been doing selective breeding programs for hundreds of years, and I think you can, you know, to some degree, you can um, have some success with that, but uh, ultimately, you know, trees are relatively long lived, slow growing organisms, and when you don't find out till a year, 60 or 80 or 100, whether the tree grows straight, lives long, <coughs> maintains that fast rate of growth. I mean, it's, it's a long-term project. Yeah, there's a fairly simple way to think about this. If, um, if we were able to completely solve the fossil fuel problem by sequestering the CO2 in wood, then we could run our economy on the wood that we're growing, right? We could burn it. And you pretty much have a kind of a, uh, an instinct that we can't do that, and you're right, we can't. So the, the numbers don't work out. Ma'am. Um, yeah, I didn't hear that question. Would you please repeat the question? Did you hear the question? I heard part of it. 
So that's a really good question. I think this goes to Andrew's comment that trees do a lot of other things besides sequester carbon. So you'll sequester a little carbon in them, but that's, that's not the real benefit. Now, the tree will change the surface climate because it shades the surface and it evaporates water instead of allowing the heat to be deposited and re-emitted back to the atmosphere into you as radiant heat or sensible heat. So trees will improve the environment and make it feel cooler. Um, and so it's a darn good idea to plant those trees in New York. But that, it, it's, it actually, it's a very nice way to start to think about the other benefits of forests that are not directly carbon related, but all those other services that Andrew talked about. If anything. I was just going to say, um, I don't know what, there's often, uh, there's a question for Bill. Bill, how many, in a typical hectare at Harvard Forest, how many trees are there? 1,000, maybe? 100, yeah. Okay. So I guess the, the, my point was just that a million trees, though, is not that big. You know, if it's an area, a densely, um, a dense forest, a million trees might be 10,000, 20,000 acres, hectares. Yeah. hectares. And uh, that's just not that big an area in the context, say, of New England as a whole. So it's not going to have that much of a climate change impact. But the, the other benefits of having trees around, I, it's a winner in both wa in both ways. Just that it's not that important for climate change. Yes, ma'am. So that was a monthly average, so it was a typical day for a month. But you're 100% right, there is a lot of variation. And it turns out to be related to th some things that we understand and some things that we don't. So if you have a really bad year, there might have been an ice storm the previous year and knocked a lot of branches off. Um, lots of other things, lots of disturbances like that. Maybe you had a, 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 a frost when the leaves were coming out and damaged your canopy. That would probably give you a bad year. And, and some of the other factors that affect we don't really know. Uh, and when you have a good year, everything lines up. You don't have the frost, uh, and you get, a, you get a big year. And so uh, you're 100% right, it's highly variable. But that wasn't a single day, it was, it was a typical day. It was a monthly average day. Sir. It's a really good question. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know that. I, I, I'm not that confident that we'll understand it. I think we hope we can. But what do you think? Um, yeah. Well, so, yeah. Some of the feedbacks are good. Like um, trees take take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, but other other th a lot of these things can be modeled. And we can put them into models and try to forecast what's going to happen in the future. But the models themselves, the way some of these processes interact, um, just aren't that well understood. And, and you can't necessarily, it's kind of like what Steve was saying with uh, fertilization. You know, you can't add more to say what might have happened in the past because more, more nitrogen on the forest isn't necessarily a good thing at this stage. Um, I worry about invasive species a lot. So uh, we have a, a more and more invasive species basically because we move stuff around the planet a lot. And if you look at New England, we used to have dominant chestnut trees. They're gone. Elms, they're gone. If that longhorn beetle gets established, watch out for the sugar maples. So um, I'm very concerned about that. And there's a climate interaction there, and then there's 
other human activities. And we can't model that. So yeah, and, and invasive species are a good example because both the, the hemlock willy adelgid locally and the mountain pine beetle um, out west, recent warmer winters have, well, cold winters would knock the, the beetle back and prevent it from spreading as rapidly as, as, it, as it might. Recent warmer winters have allowed the beetle's range uh, or the adelgid's range to expand and move into territory it wasn't before. Um, and so continuing climate change will allow uh, those insect pests to get into places that without climate change uh, they might not. So there, there's that kind of interaction that's very hard to forecast because we're just going beyond, we're going beyond what we know, you know, before, beyond what we've seen in the past. Sir, here and then there and then there. It's, it's basically um, that period of expansion of forests has or is over. So um, it re really represented the decline of agriculture in New England, and it's done. And so one of the things that David talked about in his talk a few weeks ago was that some areas are now turning back and going back down again. Sir. I'm curious whether your uh, research is telling us anything interesting about whether we should use <laughs> you take that one. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it might make sense for small scale kind of things. It's certainly not a cure for New England as a whole. Um, It's a really silly thing to do with fiber. Sarah, up there, yes. He, he actually got my question. A lot of my neighbors in Maine burn cords of wood instead of gallons of oil. And on, on a situation where, where the woodlot is sustainable, uh, do you feel for home use, uh, it's practical. And, but really my question is, what's the relative contribution of CO2 to the atmosphere uh, from heating units generated by wood versus so you know, a woodlot operation can be quite sustainable and um, in a s small scale, which just as Andrew said. So, if I have a woodlot, I could sequester more wood, more carbon, and burn the small stuff that I take out by hand, and heat my house with it if I have enough acreage, right? And that's just fine. But it's not it's not um, the same thing as a um, wood to electricity plant that I'm going to build. And the other thing to think about is that the, uh, the wood stove is generally a pretty heavy polluter of the atmosphere. And that's a problem. So we used to have a wood stove in my uh, house, and my wife kicked it out recently. Okay. Too much but pollution. Can I just add two things to that? W one is that um, it, I think it only, it only <laughs> potentially makes sense if the wood is, is local and not if you're um, you know, if you've got the woodlot right in your backyard, that's great, but if it's coming from halfway across the state or wherever, um, that's a bad idea, especially right now with the concern about spreading um, invasive pests and bugs. A lot of, a lot of those, um, is it the Asian longhorn beetle and uh, emerald ash borer, there's really concern that those are going to move from one area to another and transported firewood. Um, the second thing I was going to say is there's also a difference between the carbon that's released from burning wood versus released from uh, burning fossil fuels. And that fossil fuels is old carbon um, that's getting put back into the atmosphere. And the, the fact that wood is renewable, um, I think, does have some, something to say for it, um, that it's just it's carbon that was taken out last year or five years ago. Um, that being said, pretty much, it's pretty certain, I think, that unless there's some really remarkable technological breakthrough, um, all the fossil fuels in the ground now will be burned within the next 150 years. I mean, that's, it's just going to happen um, unless some cheaper alternative comes along. Yes, yes sir. 
in mm -hmm. general. I, I was confused by your answer about that. You said it seemed to add greater growth to the plants, but then some died. I, could you say a little bit more about that or, or lead us to a website or something? So um, the Department of Energy funded a whole bunch of uh, so-called FACE experiments, free air carbon exchange, so the uh, carbon enhancement experiments. And uh, it's actually really hard, very expensive, to fumigate a full stature forest with CO2. They spent millions of dollars on putting CO2 into the atmosphere to, to fertilize these forests. And the results were confusing because forests are complicated, and, uh, and they gave up on it. So to do a full stature forest is really hard. What I, what I said about the, the glasshouse experiment, I was really referring to annual plants. So if I put an annual plant in these enhanced CO2, they would grow faster, and then their, their lifespan is limited, so they die. And sometimes they fruit earlier, and sometimes they don't fruit at all. So you wind up with all kinds of odd things happening to them. But one other thing, are they, all the other variables, have, were they adjusted in those experiments? For example, CO2 grows up, the amount of water would uh, yeah, they do multifactorial experiments, but th th it's very hard to do on a large scale. It's only on the small scale. Uh, we're going to take one more question over here, and then I'm going to end with one question. Sir. Plant life other than trees, lesser if you will, grasses, uh, vines, crops, how does it compare in the uptake, downtake cycle with trees? Is there something magic about trees Savannah. as opposed to other lesser <laughs> growing things? Um, some crops, I mean, Steve's numbers showed peak rates of photosynthesis of, say, I don't know, 20, well, we won't get into the units, but it's like 20 to 25. Uh, a corn or soybean crop could be 40 to 60. But there's a difference in that the, the corn and soybeans, uh, although they're doing a lot of photosynthesis, it's going into plant matter that is more rapidly decomposed and, and wouldn't be there, even if you, you cut it down and um, you know, piled it up, it's going to decompose much faster than, than the wood. It's not, going to, it's not a long-term um, sink for carbon, I wouldn't say. Yeah. Since he took part of my question, I saw a last hand here. That chart actually showed the volume of wood. That's what it showed. So the, yeah, well, I, I put it in carbon units, but the volume of wood, I mean, there's a wood density correction there, but the volume, basically the volume of wood in oak has increased dramatically. It's probably <clears throat> 25, 30 percent in the time span of our experiment, whereas the hemlocks much less, and the other things haven't increased at all. Uh, yes, they are. Oak is a mid-successional species and hemlock is late successional. That's right. It's a little surprising then that the hemlock is growing Well, it's telling us that Harvard Forest, even though it's 110, 20 years old, is still a middle-aged forest. It's not an old forest. On behalf of everyone, I would like to thank you, Steve, and you, Andrew. Thank you. Good job.